Hey, it's Larry. Uh, thanks for listening. Happy New Year. Real quick, before we get into this episode, I had such an amazing, eye-opening, life-changing experience at the World Parkinson Congress in Kyoto that I want others to have that opportunity, too. So Becca Miller and I and 24 of our PD community friends have launched a year-long WPC Travel Grant Fundraiser. We're each doing a two-week Facebook fundraiser. Mine's underway right now because my birthday's January 9th. All the money raised will be used to help offset travel costs so more people with young-onset Parkinson's can attend the next WPC in Barcelona in 2022. You can search out details on the When Life Gives You Parkinson's Facebook page or donate directly to the WPC website. Go to wpc2022.org slash yopdfund. If you or your business would like to supply matching funds... Hey, good on you. Email me at parkinsonspod at curiouscast.ca. And now, on with the show. Hi, I'm Larry Gifford. I have Parkinson's disease, and I'm going to the World Parkinson Congress. This is WPC 2019, the official podcast for the 5th World Parkinson Congress. The event is being held June 4th through 7th, 2019 in Kyoto, Japan. This podcast is created in collaboration with the World Parkinson Coalition and my other podcast, When Life Gives You Parkinson's. Each episode, we preview guests and topics that are going to be featured at WPC. Today, we'll discuss the importance of people with Parkinson's participating in research and learn more about what to include and exclude from your diet if you have PD. Dr. Sonia Mather is a family physician who's been living with Parkinson's for 21 years. She's a fierce Parkinson's advocate, helping to bridge the gap between patients and the medical and research communities. She works with the Michael J. Fox Foundation and Davis Finney Foundation. At WPC, Sonia will be speaking a few times. Her plenary talk and roundtable discussion are both themed around patients as living science, the importance of participating in clinical trials. She's hosting a workshop called YOPD, It's Not All About the Symptoms, Other Life Considerations, and she's speaking at the pre-Congress course, Fundamentals of PD, The Journey. Her talk there is called The Advocacy Pyramid, Patient Engagement and Communication. She joins us now. Hello, Sonia. Hello. Sonia, I look forward to seeing you in Kyoto. One of the all-time great advocates for Parkinson's disease was Tom Isaacs. What did you learn from Tom? Oh, my goodness. Um, Tom was an amazing individual and really inspired my own advocacy work. Um, he was he was brilliant at engaging patients and, and, and researchers alike. So he was... He was really fundamental in bringing all stakeholders uh, together, which was really kind of a unique, um, unique uh, asset to have. I learned uh, from him that patients need to be part of this whole um, journey in terms of, of uh, drug development, particularly, and, and being advocates for our own management. Uh, he was very much involved with. Uh, promoting patient input into not only the design of clinical clinical trials, but deciding what should be uh, looked at um, even in the first place, and certainly on the the um, um, design of clinical trials, how how they can incorporate the patient viewpoint. Because he really believed that without patient input and without the, that key patient in, input and uh, viewpoint, that there will be no chance for better treatments and a cure. That that patients need to guide the whole process. And what was or what is the advocacy pyramid? The advocacy pyramid is is how Tom uh, described that psychological journey from the time a person is diagnosed to the to their um, their work as an advocate or their development into an advocate. Um, so it, it's a pyramid that the, the starting point is diagnosis. The next point um, is what we all go through, which is that period of denial and fear and, and uh, uh, secrecy. Some of us sort of linger in this stage longer than others. And then it goes on to communication where um, people, you, you start to communicate your, your journey with other people. So you go from that feeling of, of not being understood to being understood by those around you. And then that leads to acceptance um, which is really a key factor, emotionally accepting your disease. And then you can move on to becoming involved with the patient community so that your your journey kind of goes from being um, one where you're only concerned about yourself to where you're concerned about the larger global community, Parkinson's community, and how you can become involved in that, which then again leads to advocacy where, you know, most of your time is spent in, in 
in um, working with patients um, and working on causes that will benefit the whole community, where your sort of passion and expertise and, and dedication will, are all sort of um, goal-oriented to making a difference for others. How important was it for him to lay that out so people could visually see the, the path? I think it was it was based on his own experience as well. I think it was kind of something that he had um, he had gone through and 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 it's, with his dealings with so many others that that suffer from this disease, he felt it was a common thread that we all shared, regardless of our sort of uniqueness that we have in terms of our our disease um, and how it manifests. But this is sort of the psychological. Um, thread that kind of binds us all as, as Parkinson's patients and probably can be applicable for all um, sort of chronic illnesses, really. And then how do you use it? I use it mainly to illustrate the journey. Um, so I, I've sort of been through all of the, the stages uh, over the last 21 years. Some I spent much longer in than others. So it was a kind of a, an, an interesting way to kind of document my own journey in my own mind. But it's also an interesting way to sort of help people along and discuss each each step in the journey, which is which are, are all very important if you think about it. I mean, that whole that whole um, level of acceptance is probably the most important to discuss. But yet, a lot of people are still in that denial and, and fear um, it's part of the pyramid, which again is probably the most psychologically stressful mm-hmm. uh, time that patients go through. But it, it kind of helps patients. It helps me to illustrate that there is something beyond that, that there there is an ability for us to, with introspection and support, to pro- progress up the pyramid and ultimately get to a, a position of advocacy if that's what we desire. Uh, Tom's spirit lives on in many different ways, including his involvement in the GDNF Phase Two trial, which was so brilliantly documented by the BBC. It's 2012, and 42 men and women are about to take part in one of the world's most ambitious medical trials. See you later. A search for a cure for Parkinson's. Okay. We're asking people to have experimental brain surgery. So we're going right posterior. Yeah. We're asking people to have an experimental device inserted into their heads. We're going to drive the needles in, okay? That's fine. We're asking people to have an experimental drug. We could do great harm here, and we could genuinely make people worse than they are before they started. Uh, In fact, all those people who participated are are real true heroes for the cause. Absolutely. What lessons can we learn from them about participating in clinical trials? Well, I think they exhibited the ultimate in selflessness, um, really, when they um, opted for the GDNF trial. It was such an invasive trial. So, I mean, what I got from them was not only that selflessness, but that strong, necessary emotion of of hope or that um, optimism. I mean, these people subjected themselves to significant risk um, in in that trial because it was such an invasive one with, with with catheters being placed in the brain. They were, they were the true demonstration of what we all need to do or all need to understand, which is that we are really the answer, the answer sort of in us. If we don't participate and support our research and um, medical communities with, through, through participation, there will be no better treatments or a cure that can occur without our participation. And one of the main problems with most tri- uh, clinical trials is that the recruitment doesn't occur. So as much as we do want to participate, we often don't participate. And that is, is really detrimental to our own, our own future. So I think that um, it was such a strong and extreme example of that selflessness and that, uh, that feeling of hope and that desire to help others. Uh, let's go back to what you just said. You talk about how people with Parkinson's, they say they want to participate in clinical trials. What are the, mm-hmm. what are the barriers from keeping folks like us from doing it? I think there's a lot of myths and misconceptions about clinical trials. I mean, I think some of the barriers are probably logistical. Um, it's hard sometimes to fit uh, into our schedules, especially when you have young onset and you may be working, maybe raising young families, maybe don't have the time to go, and some of the clinical trials can be quite involved in terms of time. Um, so I think some of it is logistical. Some of it is that people just don't know how to find clinical trials that they would qualify for that would be in their geographical area in order to, to participate. And then there's also the misconceptions. Some people 
like the idea of clinical trials, but are fearful that, for, for instance, that they will um, lose their current medical care, um, that they may be subjected to tests and follow up that can be painful um, or, or certainly inconvenient, that they could be sort of act as guinea pigs for um, potentially uh, dangerous um, medications or treatment plans. So I think that there's a lot of those myth, myths and misconceptions that also kind of limit our, our participation as well. And I think it's important for people to learn about clinical trials and understand that there's probably a clinical trial that can suit anybody. Um, there's observational clinical trials where you just sort of fill up questionnaires. There's genetic clinical trials where you have to give a sample maybe once. There's lots of clinical trials that you have to go in one time and are not subjected to long follow-up. And then there, of course, are more invasive clinical trials. But without those clinical trials, you know, the science can't progress. Our understanding of the disease won't progress. And certainly the development of new treatments won't occur. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you, you can stand back as a person with Parkinson's and goes, where's my cure? Come on, I'm ready for it. Mm-hmm. But it's like, I, if, if you're not participating, it's not going to happen. Exactly. I mean, I, and I did that for a long time. People would often come up to me as a, because I'm a physician and say, so where does the, the um, research stand at the moment? And I would kind of answer, well, they're working on it. And I thought, after a while, it was kind of like, well, they can't work on it. I mean, they include us. <laughs> you know, we can't expect them to do anything without our participation. And that's just, it's not going to happen unless we take an active role. So when people go, hey, Sonia, I want to get involved. Uh, what can I do right now to participate? What do you tell them? Well, I congratulate them first on making that decision to go from that period of, of sort of looking more towards um, themselves and, and sort of thinking about the, the broader good. I think that is an, an amazing um, gift to give to the, the community. Um, but I, I will often tell them to look into sort of databases like the Fox Trial Finder, for instance, which is kind of like a match, match.com <laughs> for <laughs> clinical trials where you put in your um, demographics and, it'll, and, and your Parkinson's history and it will come up with clinical trials that may be suitable for you based on the d- data you've entered, as well as your geographical area. And the percentage um, of success and happiness may be better than Match.com, so hey. Yeah, <laughs> they may very well be. Right? <laughs> uh, what are you looking forward to most in Kyoto? Um, I'm looking forward to Kyoto. I've never been to Japan. But the World Parkinson Congress in general is probably my favorite meeting to attend because it's sort of a grouping, uh, it's, a, it's a coming together of all stakeholders involved. It's not just for researchers, which I sometimes attend. It's not just for patients, which I sometimes attend. It's a coming together of patients, care partners, physicians, researchers. And it's it's really a wonderful way for everyone to interact. I mean, there, there's still researchers out there that may have not even met a patient with Parkinson's. So for them, I think it's a learning experience in and of itself to, to sort of interact with people with, with Parkinson's. And it's a, it's a really unique um, meeting from that perspective. And the, and the content, of course, is amazing. Well, and having been there before, not to Kyoto, but to the World Parkinson Congress, yes. uh, what advice do you have for people like me who've never been? Uh, take a deep breath when you look at the uh, agenda, because <laughs> there's it's, a lot to choose it's from. It's a lot, yes. Yeah, there's a lot to choose from. I would say um, plan ahead. You don't want to kind of be stuck uh, trying to figure out where to go next in a, in a place like that, because it's often quite large in terms of, of, of size of the venue. Um, so go through your agenda, first of all. And and it's, it's, it is quite well laid out in terms of it will tell you the... Um, scientific rigor, which the, the, the speakers will be speaking to in the subject matter. Um, there's lots of, so there'll be like, you know, things that are more suitable for you if you're a patient versus a, a, um, a, an academic researcher, for example. But there's often, there's, there's much opportunity for you to interact with others. Um, but I would plan ahead. That's a big thing. Look at the agenda, see what um, you're interested in, and I'm sure there will be a session on it. Um, the other thing is to look at the roundtables and register for the roundtables if possible. Um, these are more small and intimate discussions with with um, some with a host that has some um, uh, experience in, in what you're you're going to be discussing. So it's an often a good time to be able to ask questions in a more intimate setting. So as you're packing up for Kyoto and you're putting in your clothes and your t- toiletries and whatnot, what what must have item are you going to sneak in there so you have it there? 
That's a good question. So some people are putting a, a translator app on their phone. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Uh, some people are comfortable shoes are a must. Oh, yeah, comfortable shoes are definitely a must. I've done the mistake of, of not uh, of packing for fashion instead of function, and that has not worked <laughs> out very well. So definitely that. For me, I'm a little bit more nutritionally challenged at times, um, so I'm going to pack in some you know, protein bars and that sort of thing to keep me going because sometimes it's such a busy time, you don't really have time to grab a bite, so it's... Um, you don't want to be hangry when you're at the session. So <laughs> we don't want anybody uh, hangry. No, no, no. So I think uh, protein bars are going to be my my go to as well. And I want to mention that you have two great kids books about Parkinson's shaky hands and my grandpa's shaky hands. Uh, I just started reading shaky hands with my son and I finished the first chapter and he was falling asleep and he, he woke up and he goes, Dad, I said, yeah, he goes, keep reading. Oh, yeah. that's so sweet. It was great. Oh, that's great. Yeah, the, the books, that, that particular book, The Shaky Hands, The Kid's Guide to Parkinson's Disease, was a very cathartic thing for me and my daughters. We all kind of worked on it together. There's um, perspectives from my oldest in there, well, when she was a lot younger. Um, and it was a, a, a good way because I think that what happens is that children really fear what they don't know. And, and when they have a greater understanding of what they're witnessing, um, that they can come to terms with it a lot easier. So I think creating that open dialogue and using any book um, is, is really important as a guide. Yeah, well, I like how he uses analogies. It, it, you know, it, it speaks, it, it doesn't uh, speak too far down to them, but it puts things in perspective and equates things to like, you know, dopamine's kind of like the oil that uh, on your bike chain, you know, type stuff. Yeah, well, I think that's important because I, I do think um, that if they're able to learn some terminology, if they're at that age, I think that's important too, but that's just the science science side of myself. I do think, though, that it's important for them to understand what they're reading and putting it, those analogies in, I, I found how, was helpful for my own daughter. So that's why we put them in the book. Helpful for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. I look forward to seeing you in Kyoto and uh, safe travels. Thank you. We'll look forward to seeing you too. Larry, take care. For those of you who know me, this will come as no surprise, but I love food. Eating is one of my favorite pastimes. I'm thinking about Kyoto and the sushi and the ramen and, oh, can't wait. I've never met a food I didn't like, but I'm pretty sure the foods that I enjoy the most are the foods I should probably avoid regardless of the Parkinson's. Hey, Larry, what's the connection to food and Parkinson's? Oh, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Enter Lori Mishley. Lori is a naturopathic physician and a nutritional neuroepidemiologist based in Seattle, Washington. Let's start with the obvious. Lori, what is a nutritional neuroepidemiologist? So what that means is I study populations from the time of diagnosis forward. Uh, there are, uh, historically, epidemiology has, has been about studying populations to find out who gets disease. And so, for instance, we have lots of studies that say the more dairy you eat, the more likely you are to get Parkinson's. The more green tea you drink, the less likely you are to get Parkinson's. And so what happens in traditional epidemiology is the study ends as soon as the person is diagnosed. All we're really asking about is, are there things early in your life that may increase or decrease your risk of diagnosis? And so the problem is that uh, patients who have Parkinson's go into their neurologist and say, hey, should I start drinking a bunch of green tea? Should I stop eating dairy? And traditionally, we haven't, we haven't had an answer to that. The truth was we had never asked. We had never done what is called clinical epidemiology, where you start with diagnosis and follow people forward and say, from the point of diagnosis forward, are there decisions people are making, foods they're eating, vitamins and minerals they're being exposed to or deprived of that might be influencing the rate of progression? And so that's really what I'm doing is large scale zooming out, looking at people who have a diagnosis of Parkinson's. I've been following over 2,000 people around the world uh, for about seven years now, looking at modifiable variables associated with different rates of progression. Wow, that uh, that's needed. Um, just from personal experience, uh, I think the most unsolicited advice I receive is about my diet. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So I'm going to list some of the suggestions that have come my way, and you can grunt or moan as you feel appropriate. Okay. <laughs> uh, I should go on the high protein keto diet. 
It's going to make medications really difficult. Um, so low carb has some some value. I think getting the refined and processed foods out of your diet might be valuable. A recent study in Australia did show that um, in the short term, when people went on a ketogenic diet, their symptoms improved, specifically non-motor symptoms. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, the diet that I have the people who are, have the best outcomes over time following diagnosis are eating a ton of fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, nuts and seeds, non-fried fish, olive oil, coconut oil, wine, fresh herbs and spices. And so that really is more of a Mediterranean diet right. than a ketogenic diet. And that's been recommended. Also, somebody said, oh, you need to go, uh, you need to go avoid gluten at all costs. If you happen to have celiac disease, I think that's absolutely <laughs> important. Um, for most people, I think it's probably overkill. And in fact, it can actually remove a lot of important fiber from the diet. I will say that there is a tremendous amount of incongruence between the number of people who have overt allergies to to gluten and the people who report feeling better when they get it out of their diet. And so I don't know if as scientists there's more to gluten sensitivity than just antibody response and we'll learn that over time. Maybe patients are actually onto something that providers and researchers have not yet discovered or um, the other possibility is the anti-gluten craze has just taken over and um, people think they feel better. Right following but more there, there actually is a tremendous amount of research uh, coming out these last year or two years year and a half showing that um, the human body makes alpha synuclein in the first place in response to intestinal inflammation oh. and so more and more we do need to kind of focus in on what in the world could be causing intestinal inflammation in people with Parkinson's. And for some people, it could be celiac disease. For other people, it could be an infection. For other people, it could be lactose intolerance. And so I, while not everyone with Parkinson's needs to avoid gluten, um, it is actually fairly common that people will tell me that they feel much better when they start eating low carb or at least eliminating refined processed foods. Now, on, the, on the flip side of that is the seven to one diet, seven parts carb to one part protein, which people say is the best thing for Parkinson's. I really is going to depend on where those carbohydrates are coming from. I mean, theoretically, you could get that from juice. Right. Um, so I, I think that if those carbohydrates are coming from fresh fruits and plants and things like that, um, and the low protein is absolutely going to make your medication work better. I think this link between dietary protein and levodopa availability is, even though we all know it, I think it's underappreciated in clinic. People do feel much better when they kind of start putting two and two together and realizing if they avoid protein over the course of the day, save their dietary protein for their evening meal, um, they have the whole day of better response to levodopa. And then the last one that I, I, I don't understand this one at all, but I've gotten it recommended a couple of times, people calling me at my office and leaving me messages. The vitamin supplement guys claimed that he had actually cured um, some billionaire living in Alberta of Parkinson's disease by giving him a combination of uh, his vitamin supplements plus an absolute crap ton of eggs, like about 24 eggs a day. When he prescribed eggs to people, he said you were supposed to eat them uh, soft, scrambled. Oh, my goodness. No, I think that's probably a bad idea. Okay, um, good. I, I thought I was losing my mind. Let's just leave it there. Um, it does, uh, on my research, it does look like eggs uh, don't quite reach statistical significance for being protective, but they're pretty close. Um, they do seem to be a pretty decent food for people with Parkinson's, um, but they don't quite reach the list of protective. So I wouldn't steer away from them, but... 24 a day may be overkill. <laughs> uh, so in your experience, how important is our diet as, as we're dealing with Parkinson's? I think it's tremendously important. I think it is, um, you know, I've been studying all these different modifiable variables. And uh, to be completely frank, even though my PhD is in nutrition, my undergrad's nutrition, my went to nutritional medical school, um, I want nutrition to, to be part of the solution, and I do think it's part of the solution, but I will still say that it, it is less important than social health and exercise. Oh, okay. 
uh, and, and does it matter the, the organics and the local sourcing? Does that matter more? Yeah, it actually does. I mean, that was one of the questions I wanted to know. I mean, obviously, there's all this news online and this urban legend that that's good for us. Um, so that was one of the questions, two of the questions that I added to the study that we've been doing. And it's a true false section. And, and people who say true to the statement, I try to eat organically grown foods when possible, um, are doing significantly better than people who do not go out of their way to try and eat organic. And the same thing is true for a statement about I shop at local farmers markets, co-ops, and try to eat locally or seasonally. Um, those people are doing statistically better than people who don't go out of their way to make that effort. So uh, through your research, what's the most encouraging thing you've come across so far? That this is modifiable. Uh, my whole goal was to kind of figure out who are the people who are doing best and without bias, without my opinion, without my ideas, just kind of describe what I call the positive deviance. Who are the people doing unusually well 20 years following diagnosis? And uh, let's find out what characteristics and foods and supplements and activities they have in common and see if we can teach other people to do it. And that's what I've been doing in clinic. That's what I've been doing with our Parkinson's summer school. We've kind of been taking this body of research now that we know who's doing best and what they're doing differently. And we've started teaching it to everybody. And it's pretty incredible to start to see uh, Parkinson's severity scores decreasing. And so where do, where do I begin? What, what should I do? This weekend, I'm going to go to the grocery store. What should I be looking for? As many fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, non-fried fish, nuts and seeds as possible. Um, get yourself kind of some vegan plus fish or Mediterranean type cookbooks. Um, I think it's important to say the opposite. The foods that are associated with statistically significant faster Parkinson's progression are dairy, beef, fried foods, soda, uh, canned fruits, and canned vegetables. All right. Well, uh, so th well, that, that, that's good. But I think that's that advice was never available to me. I've only been diagnosed for a couple of years now. But like I've asked my neurologist, you know, is there a diet? Is there something I should do? I just you know, don't eat protein around the time you take your meds. You know, that's, that's all they say. I am working on disseminating my research as quickly as possible. And <laughs> one of the reasons I'm so excited to come to the World Parkinson Congress, I think it's a great opportunity to reach a lot of people. And um, and we're publishing this as fast as we can. And I do think it helps when when patients can walk into their neurologist's office with you know published peer-reviewed papers that show that we're really using very um, strict scientific methods to ask uh, kind of cutting edge questions in a very unique way. Is there somewhere online that people listening can uh, look up your, uh, your research? Yeah, I have a personal website. It's called educationismedicine.com. And the paper I'm talking about right now where we published our first round of who, what are the supplements and foods that people are eating associated with progression is publicly available for free. That link is, can be found on my website, but the name of the paper is Diet and Nutritional Supplements and Parkinson's Disease Progression. It comes up fairly easily if you just Google Michelin Diet or something like that. Excellent. And uh, what are you looking forward to most in Kyoto? The community. I think the Parkinson's community is one of the most uh, vibrant, motivated, uh, kind, supportive communities out there. Um, it is, I, I really think of all the neurological, neurodegenerative, and psychiatric diseases we have, I think the first big win is going to come from this community, and it's going to be patient-led. Awesome. Well, we look forward to uh, seeing you, Lori, in uh, Japan and hearing more about uh, your research. And, and you've got two uh, main themes while you're there, the ins and outs of eating in Parkinson's disease. And is there any evidence that nutrients modify PD? Yeah, um, there are a couple posters that have just been accepted to be highlighted as well that I think are really important. I'll just mention I'm, I'm doing a couple talks during the biomarker session. We are going to be reporting on um, I have two truffle hunting, Italian truffle hunting dogs that I have trained to smell Parkinson's from earwax. And we're going to be um, revealing the sensitivity and specificity of what we hope to be an early Parkinson's disease screening tool using dogs. 
And uh, we are also reporting on an abnormal amount of fungal uh, mycotoxin being excreted in the urine of people with Parkinson's disease and talking about what implications that has and what follow-up is necessary. And so um, while I'm certainly excited about all the nutrition stuff I'm doing, I am equally excited to be um, making as much headway as we are in the biomarker field and the field of prevention. That is huge. That is, that's amazing. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited about it. Each episode of WPC 2019, I'm going to provide a Kyoto life hack, a tip, a cultural insight, etiquette advice, language lessons. It's an extra dosage travel guide to get us all better prepared for our trek in June. None of us want to offend anyone or be embarrassed. So James Heron, the executive director of the Japanese Canadian Cultural Center, has agreed to join us each episode to teach us a word or phrase and provide some insight into the culture we can expect. James, let's start with the word or phrase of the week. Well, this one will tie a little bit to uh, to what I'm going to talk about today, which is bathrooms. And mm-hmm. I guess if you're uh, if you're going to ask about the bathroom, you probably need to find out where it is. <laughs> so the phrase for where is the where is the washroom is toide wa doko desu ka? Toide wa toto toko desu ka? Doko desu ka? Doko desu ka? Exactly, yeah. It ties a little bit to the Japanese watashi wa lari desu. First of all, the first word you're using is toide, which is toilet. And wa, again, which marks the subject of a sentence. Then the word doko, which is where. And then we talked about the word des, which means, which is the verb to be. And then ka. If you add ka at the end of a sentence, it makes it a question. Okay. Toide wa doko desu ka? So um, anyway, that will get you to the bathroom. <laughs> but there are uh, there are certain things to consider when when actually you when you when you get there. Um, in in Japan, uh, you'll run into three different types of toilets potentially. There is the traditional Japanese toilet, which is a kind of a, a squat type toilet. Um, these are more and more rare all the time. Um, they're sort of, it's sort of a long porcelain trough that you would squat over and do your business. Okay. So, um, it's pretty simple, but it, uh, it can be a little bit of a challenge if, uh, if for flexibility. I'm, I'm not as young as I used to be. And, uh, yeah, some of these uh, Japanese style toilets can be a, can be a bit of work. Right. But you probably now won't, will only run into those if you are, um, you know, if you're in the, in the countryside, maybe in a little inn or something like that. Far more likely, you'll run into two styles of Western toilet. Um, they're the kind of more traditional Western toilets, which look like what we have here. One interesting difference is that on the back of and top of the tank, when you flush it, there is a little fountain that pours water out and it goes back into the tank. So the water that it's being used to flush comes out of this fountain first so that you can use it to wash your hands before it goes down into the cistern. Hmm. So it's just a little water-saving device. Um, the other type of toilet is, I don't know if you've run into these before, these, these sort of space-age Japanese toilets that are becoming more and more ubiquitous in Japan, the ones that um, actually have... Um, the water jets that uh, do a lot of the, the cleaning process for you. Yeah, I've, I've, I've read about these. I've seen video of them. I've not experienced it, but it's very intimidating. Um, they are actually, uh, they're not intimidating, and they're actually quite, quite pleasant and quite hygienic. Um, as, essentially, all you do is there's a, there's a little, um, little control panel beside the toilet, and uh, there's a lot of Japanese written on there, but there's also some diagrams which make it pretty clear what's going to happen. So there's a, a button for bidet, and there's a button for washing your other uh, nether regions, let's call them. Mm-hmm. And then there's one for dryer. So it'll actually dry you as well. Excellent. Um, I look forward to it. And some of the newer ones will also have lights on them. Um, usually they'll have a seat warmer because a lot of uh, Japanese homes and places don't have central air conditioning. So the washroom itself may not be may not be warm, but the seat will be very invitingly warm. Yeah, that's great. It's not that issue. Um, and you'll also notice that, that um, Japanese toilets are usually um, located 
separate from your um, where your your washing area will be, the, the bath and the sink and everything like that. In Japan, it tends to be sort of counterintuitive to um, to have the place that is supposed to be for cleaning to to be in the same room where you are essentially um, getting rid of uh, waste material. Right. So they tend to be separate unless you're in a in a in a hotel. Uh, sometimes in, in a small hotel room, you might have kind of a sort of a like an airplane type of bathroom where everything's sort of in the same space. Well, that certainly makes a lot of sense. Thanks, James. If you want to learn more Japanese vocabulary or dive deeper into the cultural information about Japan, Episode 7 of WPC 2019 is a 45-minute conversation with James, which should give you a good solid base before landing in Japan. From Curious Cast and the World Parkinson Coalition, this is WPC 2019. Special thanks to Drs. Sonia Mather and Lori Mishley and to James Heron, who all joined us today. Visit WPC2019.org to learn about the upcoming 5th World Parkinson Congress, a global Parkinson's event that opens its doors to all members of the Parkinson's community, including those living with the disease. Follow WPC on Twitter at World PD Congress. If you'd like to help spread the word about the podcast, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe for free. Search WPC 2019 and When Life Gives You Parkinson's. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and everywhere you get your streaming audio. You can also listen at CuriousCast.ca and WPC2019.org. You can connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just look up at Parkinson's Pod or email Pod at CuriousCast.ca. WPC 2019 is written and produced by me, Larry Gifford. Dila Velazquez is our story producer and sound design by Rob Johnston. I look forward to seeing you in Kyoto. Canada may be known for its landscapes and friendly people, but beneath the surface lies a darker side of crime, history, and the paranormal. Since 2017, the award-winning Dark Poutine podcast has explored the shadowy corners of the Great White North and beyond, delivering chilling tales from a uniquely Canadian perspective. Hosted by Mike Brown and Matthew Stockton with over 300 episodes and fresh releases every Monday, Dark Poutine is your weekly ticket to the creepier side of Canada. Listen to Dark Poutine on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts.